All right, well, thanks to all the organizers for um, uh, putting together such a great conference, and it's great to be here uh, telling you about some of the things we're doing. So our group is developing technologies for looking at and controlling neural circuits, and I'll tell you sort of two short stories here about some of the strategies that we've been working on uh, to try to help uh, make the imaging of neural circuitry and the control of neural circuitry um, more scalable and more precise. So the first thing I want to talk about is a technology that our group has been working on, which we call expansion microscopy, where we take uh, swellable polymers and synthesize them throughout uh, specimens of brain, but you can use it on other tissues as well. And if you do it just right, can you actually pull all the biomolecules apart so it becomes possible to do nanoscale resolution imaging across extended tissues with ordinary uh, ubiquitous microscopes. So this fuses together two separate and fairly established ideas. One is the area of um, responsive polymers or smart gels, and this is, goes back to the 1970s, 1980s, where people like Toyoshi Tanaka were investigating the physics of these. Um, these are polymers where, uh, for example, polyelectrolyte hydrogels, where you add water and osmosis draws the water in, the polymer threads swell apart from each other as a result, and being highly charged, they repel each other even more. The other area is embedding uh, tissues in polymers uh, and hydrogels for imaging purposes. Um, this goes way back as well to people like uh, Peter Hausen and Christine Dreyer at the Max Planck Institute, where they would take tissues or specimens and embed them in polyacrylamide hydrogels in order to facilitate their immunostaining and imaging. And this also goes back to the early 1980s. So the way that we decided to try to make this work, as shown in this cartoon, is three chemical steps. The first step is we developed handles that you can attach to biomolecules. So for example, in this cartoon, the brown blobs are proteins, and we have covalent attachments that will actually bind to these uh, proteins and equip them with polymer anchoring handles. The second thing we have to do is to embed it in the polymer, and we can do that by immersing it in a uh, monomer solution of sodium acrylate and then form through free, through free radical polymerization these chains of polymers, sodium polyacrylate, that will wind their way around and between the biomolecules. And when these growing polymer chains encounter the handles, they will become covalently attached to them. Finally, we loosen up the molecules from each other or just destroy them outright using enzymes or detergents or heat. And then when we add water, we get the osmotic swelling and polyelectrolyte charge repulsion. Uh, that um, was characterized many decades ago, but now the biomolecules will come along for the ride. So this, we call this methodology expansion microscopy. In panel B, you can see at the top what it might look like. Uh, actually, this is some data from mouse brain. Uh, and then in panel C uh, is the same piece of mouse brain tissue some number of hours later when we polymerized it and expanded it. And the polymeric density goes from being quite dense, maybe just a couple nanometers in polymeric spacing, like in the upper left, around the size of a biomolecule, if you will, to being much more extended, as in the lower left. So that result is we can anchor RNA, proteins, a variety of things, and then pull these molecules apart from each other, enabling nanoscopy on ordinary microscopes. And what you can see here um, is a piece of brain bow brain tissue. So these are uh, neurons expressing epitopes, and the epitopes are being antibody stained with fluorescent antibodies. Um, and in the top middle, you can see uh, a zoom in of the brain bow brain, um, except it's kind of blurry. That's before you expand it. And in the upper right is the same region of interest after you expand it. And so if you look at the different features, they're blurry, but now in the, in the pre-expansion image, but after expansion, you can cleanly resolve different uh, sub uh, uh, components, such as axons and dendrites. Um, you can do this for other biomolecules too. Uh, this is some other work we published uh, uh, more than a year ago on anchoring uh, nucleic acids and proteins at the same time. So you can look at gene expression at the RNA level as well as at the protein level. And it's starting to take off quite fast. So many groups have adopted this um, and applied it to human brain tissues, zebrafish, E. coli, um, all sorts of different organisms um, because of this ability uh, to do extended uh, nanoscale resolution imaging um, at uh, quite a, a high speeds on ordinary microscopes. And um, all of our protocols are posted on the web. If you go to expansionmicroscopy.org, as shown in the lower right. And we've also hosted a lot of people at short courses at MIT or elsewhere to come watch us do the work. We probably trained a couple hundred groups at this point on how to do expansion imaging. Um, and uh, it's pretty easy to do. So check out the website and I'm happy to answer questions or host people to come and learn. So that's about mapping. And the next thing I want to talk about is control. So another area that we've been working in is uh, known as optogenetics, opto for light and genetics, because these are genetically encoded reagents. 
And the basic idea is to borrow from the natural world a variety of genetically encoded proteins uh, that will convert light into electrical signals. So, you know, nearly half a century ago, um, people were characterizing light-driven proton pumps from microbes, as shown in this little schematic in the lower left. Um, these will sit in the membrane of microbe cell membrane uh, cells and uh, pump protons from one side of the membrane to the other. Around a decade later, people started to characterize halorhodopsins, light-driven chloride pumps, from the same microbes. And then around the turn of the millennium, um, other groups had found light-driven ion channels, channel rhodopsins, uh, which are found in single-celled algae. So what we and our colleagues and collaborators have been finding over the years is that members of all of these classes can be found uh, that can be genetically expressed in neurons and used to turn neurons on or off. So by activating neurons, you can figure out what kinds of behaviors or patho pathological states they trigger, and by shutting down neurons, you can figure out what they're necessary for. And so from left to right, you know, we can shine green light on neurons expressing light-driven proton pumps and pump the protons out of neurons, shutting them down. Uh, in the middle column, we can do something similar with halorhodopsins, light-driven chloride pumps with orangish light, and on the right, channel rhodopsins, um, originally with blue light, we could use to activate neurons. And in the time since uh, the original papers that we published, we've been working on extending these technologies to their physical limits. So for example, um, we recently uh, developed a halorhodopsin, a light-driven chloride pump that is responsive to red light. And so red light, of course, can go deeper into tissue than other colors of visible light. And we did something recently similar uh, with um, channel rhodopsins as well, finding a red light sensitive channel rhodopsin that we can express in neurons and use red light to activate neurons. So where are we headed right now? Well, recently we published a collaborative paper with Valentina Miliani's group, um, and her group does a lot of work on two-photon holographic neural stimulation. So use a femtosecond pulse laser to deliver brief pulses of infrared light, um, bounce them off of a spatial light modulator, which will then sculpt the light into a holographic uh, projection pattern, not unlike the one that you see at the bottom here. So you can aim light into a complex 3D pattern and thereby activate different cells um, independently, which is great because up till now, most of the papers doing optogenetic control have done sort of population optogenetics, turning on or off a whole set of cells. But of course, in the brain, uh, even cells of the same kind that are nearby each other can be doing very different things. So one question, and several groups, um, including Frank Werblins and Jawa Pan and McLean Bolton and others have been pursuing things like this, uh, one question, of course, is how do you make sure that you don't activate cells you don't want to? If you just express the opsins, these optogenetic molecules everywhere, then just aiming light at one cell might uh, excite the processes from other cells, as shown on the left-hand side of the slide. But as you can see in the middle of the slide, if you could somehow get the molecules just to express at the cell bodies, then the holographic activation of one cell will spare and not cause activation of nearby cells. So we did a pretty large screen of um, sort of opsin and peptide combinations, trying to find an optimal combination which would allow you to have a very powerful optogenetic activator that's also only expressed at the cell body. And so what we found was a combination of a molecule that we call COCHR, um, or COCHR, some people call it, um, fused to a fragment of a transmitter receptor called Ka2. And if you do that, you get expression of a very powerful molecule uh, just at the cell body so that when you activate those cells, um, you will get activation of just those cells and not neighboring cells. And that's what you see um, in this little population graph on the upper right. Uh, with regular COCHR, we get a lot of crosstalk. You know, if you activate one cell, you often drive a neighboring cell. But if you target this molecule just at the cell body, then you get um, zero spiking or synaptic transmission crosstalk. And furthermore, the COCHR is so powerful that you can use brief, um, modestly bright pulses of light to drive very, very high photocurrents and get low jitter, that is, high temporal precision activation. So in the lower right, you can see that with the uh, soma, soma targeted COCHR, we can get activation uh, with precisions that are on the order of less than a millisecond or so. So I think I'll end there, and I'll transition to the next person in, this, in the session. Thank you.